All right, yeah, welcome back to some more Magic Jewels with our Ether Revolt release. So you guys voted on the decks that you want to see, and the winner is the Flicker mechanic deck. So we have gone with a Bant Flicker deck. It's similar to the old one that we played on the channel a while back, and I'll leave a link to it at the end of the video if you want to check out the old deck for that. But we've essentially, we've retooled with a lot of Ether Revolt cards. Things like the uh, Rogue Refiner, and there's a good reason for a lot of these cards. So, what does a Flicker deck do? For those who don't know, uh, it exiles cards and then returns them. So essentially, takes them off the battlefield, puts them back on the battlefield, and that re-triggers all of their Enter the Battlefield abilities. So we've got a lot of creatures with Enter the Battlefield abilities, like Reflector Mage, when it enters the battlefield, you get to bounce a creature, that kind of thing. When Bounding Crisis enters the battlefield, you get to tap a creature. So we're trying to use a lot of these over and over and over again and get as much value out of them as possible. So it's kind of a uh, tempo deck in that sense because you're just going to be playing lands and slowing your opponent down until you get to about six to eight lands and then you just start flickering every single turn and getting stupid amounts of value. So let's go to the beginning of the deck, shall we? We've got Essence Flux, so for one and a blue, uh, one blue, sorry. Instant speed, exile tank, creature you control, then return that card to the battlefield under its owner's control. If it's a spirit, put a 1-1 counter on it. Now, I don't believe we do have any spirits, but that is a 1-mana um, do the uh, enter the battlefield ab ability again. So you can essentially call this whatever the card is that's on the field. So if Nissa's on the field, for example, we get another forest. If Reflector's on the field, then we get to bounce a creature. If Bounding Crisis is on the field, we get to tap a creature. So this actually turns into more than just saving your creature. It turns into a lot of value. So we're running three copies of that. It's also really good for uh, if your opponent thinks that they can remove a card. You've got one mana open. There's not really many answers for that, but Essence Flux is right there to protect your creatures. We then have Long Road Home. This is another flicker card. So for one and a white instant speed, exile target creature. So this is one that we can actually target our opponent's creatures with. It's very important. can come in very handy and saved me a fair few times in the past. At the beginning of your next end step, return that card to the battlefield under its control with a plus one plus one counter on it. So this is a flicker card that does not return your creature immediately. So if your opponent goes for a board wipe or something like that, you might want to save your green warden of Marassa, for example. You want to long road home it. It gets exiled, stays off the battlefield, then your opponent's board wipe resolves and your card comes back on your end step. So you can save a, one creature with this. You can also target your opponent's creatures as well if they're going to swing in for lethal with something like an Ulamog or things like that. You can exile it. It will come back with a 1-1 counter on it, but you've just stopped your opponent from killing you for a turn essentially. So it's really good for that kind of thing. Yet again, it's also a cheap flicker card as well, so you can save your own creatures quite often with it. Next we have Declaration in Stone, this is one of our removal pieces, so for one and a white sorcery speed, exile target creature and all other creatures its controllers controls with the same name as that creature. That player investigates for each non-token creature exiled this way. So I'm expecting with the new release that we're going to have a lot of artifact creatures, a lot of thopters and servos and stuff like that, so Declaration in Stone is likely to be very useful. If we find out in the meta that it's not, then we'll probably swap it out for something uh, a little bit different, but Declaration in Stone is absolutely superb as removal, so that's why we got it. Next we have Nissa. we've spoken partially about her, she's a 2 and a green legendary creature, 2-2. Uh, when she enters the battlefield, you get to search your library for a forest card, reveal it, a uh, basic forest, sorry, more specifically, uh, reveal it and put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, if you have 7 or more lands, exile Nissa and return her to the battlefield, so... Nissa is great for card advantage, she's great for sorting out your mana in the early game as well. She can only get you a forest, so she's not going to get you the other colours that you need. But still, she's really good at that sort of thing. And if you have seven or more lands, which uh, that's usually when our deck starts to go off and go a bit crazy, then she gets to flip into Nissa Sage Animist, a three loyalty planeswalker. She's got a plus one ability to reveal the top card of your library. If it is a land, you put it onto the battlefield, so you get to ramp. If it's not, then you put it into your hand. So regardless, that plus one ability is going to give us some sort of advantage, whether it's card advantage or ramping, essentially. Um, her minus two ability is her way of protecting herself. You get to put a legendary 4-4 green elemental creature token named Ashaya the Walken World onto the battlefield. So a 4-4 elemental, essentially, to block your 
uh, opponent's creatures. Not too useful, but there will be scenarios where we might want to play Nissa into um, an undefended board, for example. And we might be forced to put down a 4-4 just to keep her safe until we can lay down a few more flickering creatures. Her ultimate, uh, we probably will get to this fairly often. If we can keep our opponent's uh, creatures at bay, we do have a lot of ways to stop them from attacking. So there's a very good chance that Nissa gets untouched for most of the time that she's down on the board. So her minus 7 ability, untap up to 6 target lands, they become 6-6 six, six elemental creatures and they're still lands. So that's six six sixes, which is pretty sweet. That's going to be lethal, essentially, for most decks. We then have Reclamation Sage. So anticipating that a lot of artifact decks are going to appear, a lot of vehicles, things like that, we're running two copies of Reclamation Sage. I don't want to run three copies because running three, you only really want to do that if the entire metagame is running artifacts, and we're not entirely sure if that's going to happen. But... Reclamation Sage gets rid of any artifacts, it gets rid of your Sky Sovereigns, your um, Gear Hulks, it gets rid of enchantments as well, so if Tutelage is still going to be a thing, probably, then it can get rid of Sphinx's Tutelage. I did have an enchantment based um, game earlier, so I could get rid of the uh, Sigil of the Empty Throne, yeah, we can get rid of that before they even got any value out of it. So Reclamation Sage is pretty good. And yet again, we can keep flickering this for as long as we want. So if they are an artifact-based deck, then we can absolutely destroy them as long as we can keep Reclamation Sage around and we have Flicker to keep uh, getting the value out of them. We then have Reflector Mage. We've got three copies of this because it is absolutely brutal and was recently banned in Standard. Ooh, I wonder why, because it's broken and horrible. <laughs> so for one, a white and a blue, we get a 2-3 creature. When Reflector Mage enters the battlefield, target creature and opponent controls, uh, you return target creature and opponent controls, sorry, to its owner's hand, and they can't cast the spell with that name until your next, until the next turn. So if you bounce one of their creatures, if they've got multiple versions of it in their hand, they can't play any of them, so it locks up their hand just a little bit. Also slows them down if it's their only creature, for example, then we can lock it in their hand. And maybe that's the one creature that they might be able to block with the next turn to survive. And we've just stopped them from doing that. So Re Reflector Mage is really good. Flickering this guy is absolutely obnoxious for our opponent. They hate it so much because we can do this every other turn. So being able to bounce our opponent's stuff and keep it in their hand for a very long time is really good. We then have Bounding Crisis. It's only two copies because Reflector Mage is just better, in my opinion. So, um, But it does have a lot of uses. So for one, a green and a blue, a 3-3 three, three fish lizard creature. It has flash, which means we can cast it at instant speed, essentially. So on our opponent's turn, before they go into combat, we can tap down one of their creatures, for example. We could also use it to flash in and block a creature. We could flash it in, block a creature, and flicker it so that we get double value out of it. Lots of stuff we can do with Bounding Crisis, so we've got two copies of that. Next we've got Rogue Refiner. So for one, a green and a blue, a 3-2 human rogue creature. When it when Rogue Refiner enters the battlefield, you get to draw a card and get two energy. So this is essentially the swapped out version for Elvish Visionary. Elvish Visionary is a one and a green, one one that draws you a card. The reason we're going with Rogue Refiner, which is harder to cast, is one, because it's a better blocker. So if we want to block some of our opponent's creatures, we've got a better body to do that. Also, it gains us a little bit of energy, and what the energy allows us to do is play Ether Hubs in our deck. And Ether Hubs are a great way to sort out your mana. And this deck struggles a little bit with mana sometimes, but with the Ether Hub, it's just gotten so much better since the last time I played it. So this is definitely an upgrade in the uh, in the deck compared to Elvish Visionary. If you did want to cut the curve down though, then you would put Elvish Visionary instead, but you would uh, essentially cost you the Ether Hubs because you'd only be able to use them once in the entire game, which isn't great. So that's why Rogue Refine is in here. We then have Displace. This is one of the best flicker cards that we have available to us. So for two and a blue, instant speed, exile two creatures that you control, up to anyway. And then return those cards to the battlefield under their opponent's control. There is an infinite combo with this card right here, and I'll get to that very soon. So, essentially, Displace allows us to flicker two cards. We can flicker a Reflector Mage and a Rogue Refiner to draw a card, gain two energy, and bounce a creature. That's a lot for three mana. We could also, if we've got Green Warden on the field, 
then we could flick a Green Warden and another creature. And Green Warden, when it enters the battlefield, it can return a card from your graveyard. So it just re returns uh, Displace back to your hand. So essentially, if Green Warden's on the field and there's no removal in sight, then this is three mana every single turn. We can flicker a card, so there is so much advantage to be done with this. And also, this does have an infinite combo in it, and I will get to that shortly. Tamio, Field Researcher. So for one, a green, a white, and a blue. All of our colours for loyalty, Planeswalker. Excuse me, I just need to uh, put my phone on silent. There we go. Uh, for loyalty, Planeswalker. Gets to plus one. Choose up to two target creatures. And until your next turn, when either of those creatures deals combat damage, then you get to draw a card. So if we... Plus one on both of our opponent's creatures. If they want to attack Tamio, then we're going to draw two cards. If we have a decent blocker on our side and they have a decent attacker on theirs, we could select one of ours and one of theirs. And when we block, we draw a card. And when they attack, we draw a card. We also have the minus two ability. This is our way of protecting ourselves. So for tapping up to two target non-land permanents, they don't untap during their controller's next untap step. So we can lock down two of our opponent's creatures for a fair bit of time. Um, and once we've done that as well, we get a chance to do the plus one as well. So we can get a fair bit of advantage off of Tamio. But really, what we want to do with Tamio is to ultimate her. So for minus seven, draw three cards. You get an emblem with you may cast non-land cards from your hand without paying their mana costs. So this is where the infinite combo comes in. Um, if you've seen the previous version of this deck I actually pulled it off in the first video so I suggest going to check that out if you want to see the infinite combo because it is kind of difficult to pull off but we do draw enough cards to get all the combo pieces together and we get a lot of graveyard fetching as well so even if they remove a piece we can grab it back so essentially how does the infinite combo work so we minus seven and suddenly we don't have to pay any mana for anything ever again so if you remember I was talking about the green warden doing Displace and doing anything else. Essentially, we can cast Green Warden for free, and then we can Displace Green Warden plus any other card for free and get the Displace back with Green Warden. So we have infinite energy. We have infinite card draw. We can bounce all of our opponent's creatures. We can destroy all of their artifacts and enchantments, that kind of thing. We can fetch every single forest out of our deck. There is so much stuff that we can do with that infinite combo. And we can do it whenever we want as well. So we can do it in response to a board wipe, for example. We can therefore make our creatures indestructible for the rest of the game. For as long as they want to try remove it. So there's a lot of stuff. We've got almost pseudo-infinite life as well. Uh, we can only gain as much life as uh, our opponent has, essentially. Um, but it is an option there. And we can also get every single creature with three converted mana costs or less out of our deck. So there's a lot of things that the infinite combo can do for us, so it's pretty sweet. It's game over when it happens for the most part. Archangel Averson, we've brushed on her briefly, but not really spoken about her. For three and two white, we've got a legendary 4-4 angel with flying and vigilance and flash. Flash meaning that we can cast it on our opponent's turn at instant speed. So, Archangel Everson enters the battlefield. Creatures you control gain indestructible until the end of the turn. So if our opponent goes for a board wipe, we flick her Archangel Everson. Suddenly all of our creatures are indestructible. If she's not on the field, we flash her in in response to a board wipe. Yet again, our creatures are indestructible. We can also set it up though so that we can have her flip. We don't really want to do that so much. Um, mostly because it'll hurt us for a fair bit. But there are obviously scenarios where... When a non-angel creature you control dies, you get to transform it into Avacyn the Purifier. So Avacyn the Purifier is a 6-5 flying creature. It loses the uh, Vigilance, so that's something to be aware of. And if we do flicker uh, Avacyn, she will come back as her indestructible self. But whenever she transforms into Avacyn the Purifier, you get to deal 3 damage to each other creature and each opponent. So this deals 3 damage to everything, essentially, uh, except for Avacyn herself. So this can hurt us, but it can also help us under the right circumstances. So it's just a matter of knowing when that's going to be. If she does have a uh, transformation trigger on the stack, we can actually flicker her and she won't transform, which is pretty sweet. Or at least I believe that she won't. 
Uh, correct me in the comments if I'm wrong about that, please. Cloud Blazer. Three and a white and a blue for a 2-2 human scout with flying. That sounds like horrible value, except for it's not. When Cloud Blazer enters the battlefield, you gain two life and draw two cards. Actually, this is our way of infinite life, now that I look at it. Because we can gain two life and draw two cards. This is not a May ability, though, so we can mill ourselves out with this ability if we're trying to go for infinite life. So that's something to be aware of. We have no choice about drawing those cards or gaining that life. So if that's something that's going to hurt us, then don't do it. But Cloud Blazer, we've got two copies, mostly because the curve's getting quite high at this point. So we don't want the full three copies. But being able to flick a Cloud Blazer every single turn for two cards per turn and getting two life is absolutely awesome. And most of the time, if Cloud Blazer gets down and you have a flicker spell up at the time, that you can call that pretty much game over if you can keep flickering her over and over again. So it's pretty awesome. We then have Call to, for Unity. This is a new card from the Ether Revolt set. Uh, I'm not sure about this one yet. I've not managed to pull it off except for when I was winning more than I really should have. So we'll see how well it performs. But we we're only running one copy of it, mostly because it's a bit situational. So for three and two white, it's an enchantment. It has Revolt, one of the new mechanics. Says at the beginning of your end step, if a permanent you control left the battlefield this turn, you get to put a unity counter on call for unity. So flickering our creatures is a trigger for revolt. Our creatures left and they re-entered the battlefield. So as long as we're using flicker on our turn, then creatures you control get plus one, plus one for each unity counter on call for unity. So we have a lot of weak little creatures. Uh, three threes, two threes, two ones, that kind of thing. Call for unity allows us to make that so much better so that later down the line maybe cloud blaze is actually a 5-5 five five, that kind of thing we're only running one copy as i said because it's a little bit situational it kind of forces us to use our flicker on our turn and really we want to be using it on our opponent's turn in response to their removal or their attacks that kind of thing so it kind of forces our hand a little bit so it's not too useful i don't think but if it said at the beginning of each end step then this card would be broken and i'd be running two copies of it but it doesn't so I'm not entirely sure, and I'm running one copy as kind of a test to see how well it really performs. So, if you guys play the deck and you find it's not so useful, let me know, and I'll probably change it out. Next, we have Aid from the Cowl. Yet again, this is another Aether Revolt card with the Revolt mechanic. Three and two green for an enchantment. At the beginning of your end step, if a permanent you control left the battlefield this turn, yet again, we flickered a creature, for example, or one died, then reveal the top card of your library. If it is a permanent card, you may put it onto the battlefield. Otherwise, you may put it onto the bottom of your library. So, what a permanent is, for those who don't know, is any card that stays on the battlefield at the end of the turn, for the most part. That's the generalization of it. Instant speeds, cards are not permanents because they go straight to your graveyard. However, creatures are permanents, enchantments are permanents, artifacts are permanents. So, at the beginning of our end step, essentially, if we flick at a card, we get to look at the top card of our library. If it is a permanent, which likely has an enter the battlefield ability, we can choose to use it. If not, we can put it on the bottom. If it is an instant speed card, and therefore won't be put into, uh, into the field, we can still choose to leave it on top. So that is an option that's available for us. So if we really do need that flicker card that Aid from the Cowl reveals, we don't have to put it on the bottom of our library. But if it is something other than a land or a creature, then we get to choose whether or not we want to keep it, which is pretty awesome. So we'll see how well this performs as well. Next we have Baral's Expertise. This one actually came in very useful in playtesting. So for three and two blue, sorcery speed, unfortunately. However, we get to return up to three target artifacts or creatures to their opponent's hand. So that's three creatures we can bounce. It could be our creatures or it could be their creatures. So if we want to clear the board, then we use it on them. If we want to reuse some of our end of the battlefield abilities and we don't have any flicker, then we can use it on us. The second part of this card, though, says that you may cast a card with converted mana cost four or less from your hand without paying its mana cost. So essentially, the ultimate thing to do with Burrell's Expertise is a five mana, bounce three creatures, and play a... Oops. Play Tamio is one of the best things that you can do. We can also bounce three of their creatures and cast a Displace for free, bouncing two of our creatures, getting the Displace back and chaining loads of stuff. So, Baral's Expertise is set up quite a lot to do some good stuff. 
Uh, it's only a one-off, mostly because it's sorcery speed, and it's not necessarily going to come in too handy all of the time, but having it around is going to be pretty sweet. Green Warden can gr bring it back if it does turn out to be quite useful. Yet again, it's kind of another tester card to see if it performs well, but being able to cast a uh, four mana cost or less card from our hand for free for five mana plus the bounce is stupid good value, so if we can get it going, then it's pretty good. Next we have Linvala the Preserver, so for 4 and 2 white, a 5-5 legendary creature angel with flying. When Linvala the Preserver enters the battlefield, if an opponent has more life than you, then you gain 5 life. When she enters the battlefield, if her opponent has more creatures than you, we get a 3-3 white angel creature onto the battlefield with flying. So if our opponent has more creatures and we flicker, then we can get some angels. If they have more life than us, we get more life. So we can flicker Linvala and Green Warden every single turn until we have more life than them, essentially. And we have an equal amount of creatures. We can keep chump blocking with the 3-3 angels, for example, and still keep getting them back as long as we keep uh, flickering, which is awesome. Next is Subjugator Angel. It's probably one of my favorite cards in this deck. I don't really want to run too many of them. Because, as I mentioned, that the curve right at the top is quite expensive. And we've got most of the stuff at the top is utility cards that do a lot of things. But Subjugator Angel is quite capable of ending the game by herself. So, for 4 and 2 white, 4 3 Flying Angel. When she enters the battlefield, you get to tap all creatures your opponents control. So, if we have a decent board state, a lethal amount, and they have loads of blockers, we play Subjugator Angel, all of their creatures tap, and we swing in with everything to finish them off. If we are struggling to survive because they've got more creatures than us, we can flicker this card on our opponent's turn and tap all of their creatures. If we've got Green Warden on the field as well as Subjugator Angel, we can flicker Subjugator Angel and Green Warden every single turn to tap our opponent's creatures down, which buys us so much time as long as we can maintain these two on the board at a time. So it's really good value for Subjugator Angel. I ended up having a game during playtesting where I had Subjugator Angel in my hand, a board full of creatures, and about six or seven flick- uh, like, no, no, not six or seven, that's an exaggeration. We had uh, three Disperses and I think two Essence Fluxes, so I could use Subjugator Angel for the next five turns, essentially. That's five turns of tapping our opponent's creatures down and swinging in with my board and there's nothing they can do about it. That's the kind of value that Subjugator Angel can bring to the board. Next we have Green Warden. We have spoken about Green Warden. It's 4 4 and it 2 green, a 5 4 creature elemental. When it enters the battlefield, you get to return a card from your graveyard to your hand. So that could be a land, could be a planeswalker, could be a disperse. Anything we want from our graveyard is available to us. And if we flicker with disperse with Green Warden, we get to grab the disperse we just used on the Green Warden so that we can keep doing it every single turn. There is a stupid amount of value with this card, so you want to make sure that if you play Green Warden down, it's staying safe. At the very least, if you are in a panic kind of situation, that will be the only excuse to play this card without having Flicker open to keep it safe. When Green Warden of Marassa dies, you can exile it if you want, and if you do, you get to return target card from your graveyard to your hand. So if we don't have any ways of recurring Green Warden over and over and over again, then we maybe want to exile it from our graveyard and get some card out of it for a little bit of value. Because once Green Warden's gone, there's not really any way to get him back. So uh, if he does end up dying, then that second ability will come in handy and you'll get one final use out of him. Finally, we have Woodland Bellower. So for four and do green, a 6-5 creature beast. When Woodland Bellower enters the battlefield, you may search your library for a non-legendary green creature card with converted mana cost three or less and put it onto the battlefield and then shuffle your library. So three mana cost green creatures we have uh, that are non-legendary. We have Reclamation Sage. So if we have Woodland Bellower, we can grab Artifact or Enchantment Removal. We have Bounding Crasis. So if we want to tap down a creature, we have the ability to do so. Rogue Refiner, if we need energy for our ether hubs or we would like to draw a card, or even a decent blocker, we've got their option. And that's essentially it for the uh, value, but that is a lot of creatures. That's uh, three, five, seven different creatures in our deck that... Uh, well, seven creatures that Woodland Bellower can get, three different kinds of value that Woodland Bellower can grab for us. And yet again, we can flicker this to keep pulling them from our deck and get the value over and over and over again. So that's going to be the deck anyway, guys. On to the mana base. It's a very interesting one, I say. 
Uh, we've got two plains, three islands, and three forests. We're running a fair few basics because we are a three-coloured land base, so we're going to be using e uh, Evolving Wilds to grab the mana that we need at any given time. We also have the uh, check lands as well in Canopy Vista, which is a forest plains. Enters the battlefield tapped unless you control two or more basic lands. So yet again, we're running a few more basics so that once we have two basics on the field, essentially every single card in our deck, every single land, sorry, in our deck comes into the battlefield untapped. So turn one island, turn two forest. Now all of these lands here come into play untapped. And the Hinterland Harbours come into play untapped because they've got the forest and the forest and the island, that kind of thing. So we get a lot of value. We just need two basics on the field and then all of our lands are untapped from that point forward, which is pretty sweet. So same as Canopy Vista, we have Prairie Stream, except for it is white and blue. And it's about field tapped unless you control two or more basic lands. We then have Hinterland Arbor, so this is a buddy land, so Hinterland Arbor enters the battlefield tapped unless you control a forest or an island. Yet again, we have basic forests, and our Canopy Vistas have the type forest as well, which will also allow Hinterland Harbor to come into play untapped, which is pretty sweet. Just like Hinterland Harbor, we also have Glacial Fortress, except for this is white and blue, and we also have Sun Petal Grove, which is green and white. Next we have Ether Hub. Ether Hub enters the battlefield and you gain one energy. You get to add a colourless to your mana pool, or you get to add uh, you get to pay one energy and add one mana of any colour to your mana pool. So this is a great three coloured land essentially that comes into play untapped. There is a lot of value to be had from this. This is the reason why we are running our uh, oops, our rogue refiners over Elvish Visionaries, for example, because our mana base is so much better because we're adding a, an extra colour symbol into one of our creatures. And it's actually, it's not strictly better, but it's it's almost there, depending on what you're doing with your deck, essentially. I think in this version, I would stick with the refiner just so that you could run the ether hubs. But that's totally up to you if you want to run a lower curve, but you will hurt your mana a little bit because you won't be able to use ether hub as effectively as you may want to. And finally, we've got four evolving wilds. So as I mentioned, uh, we want to make sure we've got all of our colours in place, so Evolving Wilds is going to allow us to do that. We are also running 25 lands, so Evolving Wilds does allow us to thin our deck when we've got the mana that we need, therefore we don't want to draw any more of it. So we get to sacrifice Evolving Wilds, search your library for a basic land card, and put it onto the battlefield tapped, and shuffle your library. So we can find any of our plains, islands, or forests. Anyway guys, that is going to do it for the deck. If you like the look of the deck, then be sure to check out the matches that should be following very shortly they'll be on the end card as well if you want to find the link for that if you did enjoy the deck tech then be sure to leave a like it helps me out a great deal lets me know you are enjoying the deck and want to see more of it if you want more ether revolt and more magic jewels then be sure to subscribe we have uh, three videos every single week and we're going to be doing another deck as well straight after this one in celebration of the new set release uh, i can't quite remember what won the vote for the second best deck, but that is the one we're going to do, um, most likely. I'm so excited for this set, guys. I cannot uh, stress enough. There is a single card that I really want to play with, and if you guys can guess it, then you get a high five. Um, if you know me well enough, then you know that this card is absolutely the card that I want to make a deck around. So, yeah, leave it. Leave it. Your guesses in the comments what that card might be. I'm sure there's a few of them, to be fair, but there is one specific card that once we're done with all of the uh, the user voted stuff, that's one that I'm going straight onto. I'm so excited to play with it, guys. Anyway, be sure to subscribe for some more Magic Jewels and hit the little bell icon right next to the subscription button to be notified when I release new videos. All right, guys, I'll see you ne next time. Bye bye.